I've been asked to talk to you about whole body MRI and how it can be used for bone disease assessment. Here are my uh, disclosures. Uh, many of you will be aware that there are multiple clinical states where tumor markers are increasing, but you don't see metastatic disease or tumor progression on conventional imaging. And this is usually due to microscopic disease, um, usually in nodes or bones, but often at other sites. Uh, and so all of us have seen patients with high-risk biochemical recurrence, non-metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, where a substantial number of these patients will in fact have metastatic disease or disease visible on a next generation imaging technology. And we find a similar problem in patients who seem to be progressing clinically, uh, but their imaging doesn't seem to be changing. And, and this is a, a quite a well-recognized issue. There's a great deal of interest in Id identifying strategies to better inform on the optimal strategies uh, for this men. And we know next generation imaging or modern imaging is effective at depicting microscopic metastatic disease or microprogressive disease. And when we use these technologies, we realize that there are imperfections in our classifier systems, which in fact drive management. And, 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 and that's the, the major issue here. So we are late at detecting disease. So, for example, if you look at this man with high-risk prostate cancer, Gleason 9, two bone scan abnormalities here and here, seventh rib, right acetabular roof. You do the CT scans and they're normal. So then the question is, these are unconfirmed bone scan abnormalities. Does he have bone metastases? Number one. But from a management perspective, is this oligometastatic disease? And if this is, this is oligometastatic disease, it should prompt you to do pelvic radiotherapy. If this is polymetastatic disease or no metastatic disease, then the choices might be different, particularly after you've treated the pelvis, because you'll be asking whether you should be treating these or other deposits, which you can't see. Now, when you do a next generation imaging technology, in this particular case, MRI and a PSMA PET CT scan, what you notice is that he's got polymetastatic disease. So on the spinning images, each of these bright spots as the skeleton spins are metastatic deposits, which you cannot identify on the CT scan. So here, for example, is the right acetabular roof on the PSMA PET CT and on the whole body MRI, which are very much positive. So this is metastatic disease. So, in, so that's in the detection setting. And then we have similar problems in the response assessment setting. So in the response assessment setting, we don't identify progression at an earlier enough time point to enable switching therapies. So we expose patients to costs and to toxicities. And, and here's an example. So this man is on prembolizumab and olaparib for prostate cancer. Now, you can see a whole body MRI scan here on the left, and I will discuss this in a little bit more detail later. But here are his bone scans, and these are his rhesus reports. And you can see we call this stable on three different occasions on follow-up. Now, we were blinded to the PSA because... It is radiographic progression that predicts for longevity. But yet this man was developing unequivocal clinical progression, but the imaging is stable. And so this patient was taken off the clinical trial because of clinical progression. You can see his PSA was unblinded, has gone up. You do the whole body MRI scan, you see a lot more bone metastases. So you can see how for CT scans, Rhesus criteria do not work because bone disease is considered non-measurable. Progression occurs and you may not see it, either because it's in normal marrow or it's within scarred marrow. And to tell the difference can be really difficult. In other words, to, to confidently distinguish sclerotic progression from sclerotic response is really difficult and the reason is that CT scans are telling you about the response of the matrix to the tumor cells. So it's the matrix tumor cell 
interaction that you are looking at. And, and so discordant distributions are in fact quite common with a number of different technologies. And it's all related to imaging physics and how that relates to bone matrix and bone cellularity. So if you were to depict or pull apart the bone marrow in a rather simplistic way, you'll notice that certain technologies can interrogate certain bone compartments. So, for example, if you were interested in the bone trabeculae and maybe osteoclastic action, then you should look at, you should be using CT scans or even FDG PET scans because FDG PET scans are positive in osteoclastic tumors such as brown tumors. If you are interested in osteoblastic activity, you should be using bone scintigraphy and its PET correlate, which is called sodium fluoride PET. If you were interested in the marrow space, in the number of cells within the marrow or the displacement of the fat by the tumor cells within the marrow space, then you should be using whole body MRI. If you were interested, as Janet has just described, on cell surface receptors, then you should be using PSMA PET, HER2 PET, depending on what tracer is applicable. And remember, some of these surface, some of these receptors are on the surface of cells, some of them are within. And of course, you can also look at tumor metabolism, such as glucose PET, acetate PET, choline PET, etc. So it's important to realize that different techniques look at different compartments within the bone marrow. So a typical whole body MRI scan, which is something we do six or eight times a day for metastatic disease, typically takes about 50 minutes. So we take an hour slot. We look morphologically at the spine and then we would look at the bone marrow using diffusion sequences. And this central ghost-like PET-like image is not a PET scan. That is an MRI scan. And what you're looking at is the bone marrow distribution because of the cellularity. But within this examination, there are two quantitative sequences, the fat fraction, the number of the amount of fat in a particular voxel, and the amount that the water moves within the cellular space. So this is the apparent diffusion coefficient. And because you're moving in two dimensions across time, it's micrometers squared per second. So let's have a look at what a metastasis should look like. So here is a metastasis. Now, many of you will be scratching your head and going, what metastasis, correct? You can't, so this is an invisible metastasis, but you can see it on the diffusion sequence. You can see it on the fat fraction, but you don't see it on the CT scan. And similarly, here you see there is a metastasis, and I think some of us might recognize that. And there it is on the diffusion sequence. So there are metastases that are visible by conventional imaging. There are metastases that are invisible by uh, CT scans. So conventionally, we've always thought about metastatic disease be being sclerotic or lytic and knowing that there are some invisible lesions. But in fact, if you look carefully, there's a whole spectrum of disease. But this is if you use x-ray attenuation to characterize bone metastases. However, if you start using next generation imaging technologies or multiple technologies together, in fact, you can come up with a different classification. And here is one such classification. So if you were looking at low cellularity and high cellularity metastases on diffusion sequences, then you'll see that in low cellularity, you have lytic lesions in myeloma. Now, many of you will be scratching and saying, hang on a minute, these are lytic lesions. Therefore, they should have high cellularity. The answer is no. In multiple myeloma, in fact, you have fat proliferation within these lytic areas. Not at all uncommon. And similarly, you can have these desmoplastic metastases, which in fact should be highly cellular, but on diffusion imaging are not. So they get classified as low cellularity. So what I wanted to do was just show you one typical metastasis. This is the sclerotic metastasis with ground glass change. You can see on the T1, you see all these lesions, but on the T2, you'll see that some of these lesions have these high signal rings. 
what are these rings? You see, now here is a CT scan on the same patient. You'll see that this dark area here in the center of the ring, in fact, represents bone sclerosis. But around the margins here, which corresponds to this ring here, in fact, there is woven bone. Similarly, if you look here, there's a ring here, but at the back here you have a metastasis. How do I know that's a metastasis? Because when I look at the T1 sequence, that's full of tumor cells. But over here, there's just this very vague um, woven bone in the posterior part of that, of that bone. So you can see how different techniques are showing you different distributions. So if we just focus in on that one metastasis, you'll see how you've got in the middle of here, you have a matrix of mineralized bone, but in fact, you've got a, a, a halo around that, and that halo is this ring that you saw on the previous image. And on the diffusion sequence, because it's bright on this sequence and dark on this sequence, it is highly cellular. So you've got this area of matrix calcification. You can see that on the CT scan. But in fact, the diffusion imaging is showing you this halo of what looks like active metastatic disease. And in fact, if you look at animal experiments, it's actually very possible to show that outside the woven bone, you get these adenocarcinoma cells in this particular instance that are eating into uh, the cortical bone. And this is what the diffusion imaging is picking up. So different techniques are picking up different aspects of the bone biology. And of course, it's all to do with this osteoclastic recruitment, causing this resorption along the margins here, and therefore causing this expansion of this metastatic deposit and delamination of the surrounding bone, and the recruitment by osteoblasts within the center and the mineralization of the bone that's causing this mineralization within the center. And if you start looking at bone deposits, you see this all the time. And you can show that this is actually true by following deposits over time. So you see this ring over here enlarges over time. So you can see how that ring got bigger. And on this image, you'll see no ring here. A dot begins to appear and there's the ring getting larger and larger. So showing you that you can actually follow these rings as there is osteoclastic resorption and the expansion of the metastatic deposit. And you can drill the bone marrow, showing that the higher the signal intensity on the diffusion sequences, the greater is the content of cells in that area. And that correspondingly has a lower amount of fat because the fat is being displaced by this increasing wave of cells that infiltrate the bone marrow. The whole body experiment consists of looking at bone and soft tissue disease and the diffusion experiment that you see is sensitive to cellularity and therefore to cellular viability and has a number of applications, detection and response assessment. The advantages are that it's widely available. Most scanners in the country can do this. Most people don't do it, but you could do it. It's actually easy to perform. It requires no radiation, and in fact, it's quantitative, and I will show you that shortly. So let's take this lady here with breast cancer. The bone scan says that, in fact, there are a couple of suspicious lesions. Ask for a CT scan, and the CT scan says, to my eye, no convincing sternal, acetabular, or T12 lesions are identified. So the CT scan is saying, I can't see anything. But this is not surprising because I've already shown you another example. Now, when you do an MRI scan, every bone has cancer. It's a stuff for the cancer. And the CT scan was reported as normal. Shouldn't come as a surprise because I've shown you examples of this already. But the reason I show you this is that you can get this quantitative distribution of the cellularity. And therefore, when you treat it, you can get a, a changing cellularity also. And you'll see on the morphological sequences, there's no change. So everywhere in the country, people would say stable. If you did diffusion imaging, you would say response because the diffusion signal intensity goes down. And you can see this signal change. 
but you also see how the apparent diffusion coefficient, the amount the water moves in one second, increases. So here's exam number one, here's exam number two, and you can see how the distribution moves to the right side. In fact, you'll notice there's a bump here, and then there's a second bump here, and this corresponds to this. So in fact, this is a heterogeneous, heterogeneous response. Now, it's possible to color code voxels depending on whether they're responding a traffic light system where red is no tumor, no response, yellow is likely to be responding, and green is highly likely to be responding, and then color code them and spatially map them across the entire body. And then you end up with images that look like this. So when you look at this image, you now know that there is a heterogeneous response to because there are multiple lesions where there is persistent high cellularity, i.e. the red areas. And then that opens the opportunity to be able to biopsy those areas. Biopsy those areas you can pick up on mutations. So here, for example, is a patient in whom the left iliac bone showed high cellularity, high signal on this image, low on this, and there was a BRCA mutation. The patient was treated with a PARP inhibitor. You can see that the ADC, in fact, increases. I'm not going to show you the histogram, but you'll notice what happens later. On the contralateral side, we have an area of resistance that, uh, that appears later, and in fact, that was drilled, and the BRCA mutation had reversed. So now, now you see the possibility for precision oncology using this technique. And we use this technique all the time to try to titrate changes in treatments before patients become symptomatic. So this patient had remained symptomatic almost right to the very end, but we were using this distribution of disease to try to titrate her treatment. So you'll see that initially she was treated with exemestane. She has a very poor response. You'll see that the proportion of viable tumor cells, i.e. the red voxels, is 95, 85, 77. Look what happens over here. See how that she seems to progress and it goes up to 97. So at this point, we switch treatment. Fulvestrin, salendronic acid, not a great response. She develops a metastatic deposit here, in fact, in the pancreas. And that was treated then with chemotherapy. And look what happens. It all goes green. In other words, there's increased water motion. In other words, effective cell kill. But it's a heterogeneous response. And you can see that pretty shortly, the tumor begins to return. And then you begin to develop these liver metastases. Then that then progresses. You can see the possibility here of using whole body MRI for precision oncology to try to titrate what you might give depending on the distribution of the disease. And in fact, we looked at this prospectively in 43 women with metastatic breast cancers and did, you know, CT scans, MRI scans, um, clinic visits, blood tests, etc., etc., and you'll see that we had 33 people who had progressed out of 43, and 76 people had progressed only in the bone, and they had bone-only disease as they went in. You'll see that two-thirds of patients were progressing only on the whole-body MRI. One-third of patients progressed both on the CT scan and on the whole-body MRI, and we had no patients that progressed only on the CT scan. And when we knew that there was bone disease progression, the bone scan was only able to depict progression 50% of times. But you can see how this particular patient is progressing on the whole body MRI scan. And here are the raw data showing marked disease progression. But this is what the bone scan says. Disease extent unchanged with no increase or decrease in the volume of lesions. That was prospectively reported. And you can see the CT scan shows a little bit more mineralization, but there's not enough there to say that this is definite progression. So you can see the problem with bone scans. Now, 
Why do people not use this technology? Well, there are a number of barriers, and we must recognize that. There is resistance among clinicians to changing staging and treatment paradigms because that's what they've been trained to do, although many of them are aware of poor sensitivity and specificity for bone scans and CT scans. And of course, there are economic forces that we have to deal with, and that creates a, a sort of two-tier system between teaching hospitals and the district general hospitals. Let's wait for the guidelines. Um, the other thing is that therapy approvals are often linked to bone scans and CT scans. And that's particularly the case with, um, with prostate cancer. And, and there's an issue there. And of course, what we're doing is we're changing the perspectives on disease prevalence. And it's not entirely clear whether acting early with these new technologies actually does it improve overall outcomes. And it's important to document that. And there are obviously going to be biases because you see stuff early. Stage migration, lead time, and sometimes even length time biases is something that we all have to acknowledge. But what I've tried to show you is that we really ought to be thinking about getting rid of bone scans. I think CT scans are here to stay because they're actually quite good at the bone matrix. These new technologies have the potential to alter the way we think when we're assessing bone disease response because it, they add a category that positively identifies response, not just progression. Whereas for bone scans and CT scans, it's just disbenefit criteria. And if we want to push this precision oncology paradigm, which is keeping people as well as possible for as long as possible by giving the right treatment at the right time, we are going to have to adopt next generation imaging technologies, but we need new studies that helps us incorporate these new technologies. But we need to focus on clinically relevant endpoints, not just improved detection, but management impacts and survival impacts. Thank you very much.